well, your tour, McCarthy's there, in, and Michael as well for having us there, of course, Michael. And the reason why we're on McCarthy's really, why we use McCarthy, we're, we're obviously honouring John Murphy and celebrating all, all his writings and, uh, and all the things he did for us and, and entertained us over the years as well as everything else. And we started here, I think, around 19... 91, we could say, oh, was 90, it? 1991, yeah. 1991. Well, I met John in 1990. We went to Bally, came to Bally in 1989, and I met him through Mick Quality, because I know Mick through the music. I'd met him at folk festivals and things around the country. I think it was a great man from the time, Algen, for a couple. And he met, he met John through Joe Reedy. Joe's an artist, and... Uh, are you an artist still, Joe, you are? I think I have a number of caps, John. Very good, yeah. I have a number of caps, and a musician as well. And he, he was doing some, um, John was doing some drawings, and John used to write things then. He used to write, send stuff into the examiner. They used to compare them to the great Patrick Alvin, who wrote um, Mad Woman of Cork, and wrote the great song James Connolly, and wrote The Last Morning, and many, many things. And I became friendly with him. He was on with, with, with um, Patrick Alvin in Bel in, in Fomoy, actually. They performed together. Patrick was very uh, impressed with him. He was a great studio and observer of human behavior. I would say he was. Uh, an amazing um, observer of human behaviour. If you read his book, the anthology, you'll see it. And, uh, he was great at words. If I was ever looking for a word, I, I'm writing many, I write many press releases, send out many flyers, and uh, I just said, if I'm looking for a word, I'm trying to say what I put down the highest etchings, or the highest tier, or whatever. I bring Johnny to go for that word, and John would have it. Could be any time of the day or night, because he, he, he was a nocturnal man. He used to say that the moon was much more important than the sun. Because the moon shone at night, <laughs> you know, at night, which is very, very good. And uh, also, he was great for the media, but you didn't have to look up a uh, dictionary, you didn't have to go to the thesaurus and see the etymology of the word, because John would know exactly. He was amazing, really. Some amazing things, really. He entertained us, and he was a great friend. And Micullity introduced me to him, and, and Joe Reedy, so they're here, and his brother is here now. And the anthology of God is writing. I have loads of them at home, so I view John, maybe Michael still, I suppose I have that width of writings at home. That books of all the stuff he wrote is just incredible and his brother um, Jerry then decided to edit it and uh, put it together with the help of the quality really. It really was an observer, if you read if you read it, even though you find it funny, some of it, he was a great observer. I mean the John Nash stories and all that, the homilies on John Nash, as Tommy thinks they're just absolutely fantastic. Weather in Ballydoll. When it's not raining in Ballydoll, it's drizzling. <laughs> When it's not drizzling in Ballydoll, it's misting. <laughs> when it's not misting in, Bally, misting in Ballydoll, there's drops in the air. When there are no drops in the air in Ballydoll, there's a black cloud overhead. When there's no black cloud overhead in Ballydoll, there's rain again in the forecast. When it's neither raining, nor drizzling, nor misting, with no drops in the air, and no black cloud overhead, with no rain in the forecast in Ballydoll, you're not in Valley Dull at all. <laughs> but on an, an, this is very funny idea, but on an agricultural crop holiday to Tenerife. Oh, well done, John. Thanks very much. I asked John, 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 I my brother said, you can't remember that we just got in matches on a Sunday, gym matches usually, and John just got to keep coming this. <coughs> While my Panama said, I was having the match more, John was observing all the things in the match, on the match, thinking of John on the sideline. And he said, to, you, know, you, you see someone on the side of the hallway, and he's threatening a player, or threatening another official, and there's plenty going on, and uh, John said, if he did half of what they were doing, he said, he'd be put away for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> man, you're first to, as a Kerry man, which is a cop man. <laughs> and that man is me quality. <laughs> so I'm going to read the hand over an injured com component, which is meaning himself. I still see the man I call the publican from time to time. I imagine that I will always be held in some regard by the publican, even if I have tested his respect for me by my somewhat public exhibitions of madness. But something altogether fortuitously happened in days of, of my regular meetings with the publican. Sitting one day in a public house, we were joined by a friend of the publican, a tall and powerful man who shares in the publican's love of traditional music and of the more artistic pursuits in life. At the end of a three-way conversation, this tall and powerful man, who I call the Kellyman, invited me to his home. The Kellyman is, in fact, a native of my own county of Cork, but so strong is his inheritance from his Kerry ancestors that sometimes in conversation with this man on the phone, I am struck by the thought, but not alone in terms of his language, but also in terms of his thought process. He is an alien intelligence to mine. 
<laughs> no, no, this is no, this is not. This is quite interesting. <laughs> I am obliged, however, to offer the reader some sort of gloss on what all this carelessness means entails. I think I can do this best by referring to the comment of an Irish immigrant from an Irish-speaking <coughs> district in Ireland, in America, at the beginning of the 20th century, which is about 1900. Perhaps it was a fellow immigrant who posed the question to this, to this same Irishman, what about education? There is no more education in the world, replied the first Irishman, who was in the Irish to speak this. Only education in how to rob people worse off than yourself. <laughs> how much more true is that comment today? Question mark on the, on the exclamation mark. The man who made that comment was not from Kerry himself, but he clearly was a man who sprung from a culture a culture indeed that had a tap root in the tradition of learning that preceded the English conquest of Ireland. Kerry would be one county where that culture survived longer than elsewhere, and my friend taps into that culture. More plainly, Kerry meant is a blacksmith, of whom it could be said that he has come to great knowledge without going to college, and I very much doubt that con contemporary culture is continuing to turn out cultured working men. Now that the, that the new role models are a cultural and a political, are a cultural and a political characters in American soaps that no one should regard as comedies. Uh, oh yeah, and we like the important. Uh, I won't read everything, but I read. This is important. Not long after I first met the Caribbean, I visited him in his home and met his wife and children. Things have developed down the years, and I attend this this family's events and funerals. But apparently, in my first few visits to his home of, of, of this family, I engaged in rapid and constant contradiction of everything the Kellyman said. <laughs> <laughs> All this contradiction very much the action of a very isolated, mentally ill person. Fortunately, the Kellyman was moved towards pity, rather toward, moved towards pity rather than taking offence before my senseless, con before my senseless mm -hmm. contradiction. I had I had found a haven. The Kellyman has had been a rock in my life more than he and his family might ever know of. It is perhaps, it, it, it is perhaps a measure of how, how advantageous this was this haven and so vulnerable was I back then. I have a picture in my mind's eye of my first meeting up with the Kellyman in the company of the publican, who, who it seemed to me that the publican was somehow handing my fragile self to the custody of the Kellyman. <laughs> I, I probably would have known John since he was, oh, yeah. we went to school together. He'd be a bit younger than me. But uh, I got to know John better when he came in here to my practice. And uh, I often drove him home. And I found John an interesting man. And more so when we started going up to court to the spot being found. There was something about that place that John Murphy was kind of uh, glued to it because if the students from the university were there and if John read a paper and if they challenged him, he was at a real hiding at that stage. And the debate could go on for about 10 minutes. John wouldn't give an inch. The more they throw at him, the more he could throw at back <laughs> with, as the fellow said, with more than university knowledge. But going up to Cork was another experience. You mentioned the roll, roll on tobacco or whatever you call it. Roll your own, yeah. Yeah, one night we were going up and he had, he started doing, he started rolling this thing. And next thing he lit it. I was driving up and I thought it kind of affected me. And I said, <laughs> John, what kind of tobacco that? That's safe, he said, I have it done myself to certify. But uh, <laughs> through the night, I'd say I was influenced by some kind of whatever weed he put into it. I don't think. <laughs> I believe it. I, it. It took me a long time to recover. <laughs> and another time up there by the crossing the bridge near outside the spot in Farnham, it was a November evening, and the, the river was very, you'd call it angry. And we decided to go in, but John stopped. And he said he couldn't go in. The river upset him. And it took him nearly 25 minutes. I coaxed him before he could cross that river. He kept I'll just read a small bit from... Uh, from Valerie. Or maybe a deity. One of the deities, yeah. <coughs> the, the language in Yeti is very... Uh, um, sparse, really, and concise. Yeti speculate on what exact happened 
to his dinosaur brothers. Did a giant meteorite, or a number of giant meteorites, strike the planet, ushering in millennia of darkness and cold, making life literally impossible for dinosaur? Or did, as some people think, a rare blight strike a small but important plant species? Important because it helped Yeti to be, uh, to be regular. <laughs> Such speculation make Yeti sad. He is resolved to watch out for falling objects and eat plenty of roughage. Belly Doll. This is a short story from Belly Doll. I'm not even sure what I'm, writing, what I'm reading it. But I can read, thankfully. Uh, before the coming of the great leveler, the great spoiler, the television set, <laughs> wit and verbal de dexterity of all kinds, from the learned to the unlettered, was highly valued in Belly Doll and Rhode Island. One such unlettered wit, a famous man in his day in Bellydoll, was Bill Drynan. Once was, uh, Bill was working in the local hospital and his job was to make the dead presentable for burial. Bill was, in other words, an embalmer of sorts in the days before the art of embalming had become a degree course. <laughs> On this particular day, Bill was to encounter a very tough customer with a big black beard on him. And of course, it was Bill's job to shave, uh, shave this. But Bill, the worst for drink, did have a, an indifferent job, only managing to scrape off bits of this in, intractable beard here and there. When the matron came to inspect the work and saw the performance, she gave out stink. I'll tell you what, said Bill, responding to the criticism. Bring me down a few candles, matron. What's the idea, Dwayne, said the matron, unimpressed. Don't wake the dead in the mortuary anywhere. Won't you be said by me, said Bill. Bring me down a few candles and we'll send you off. And anyway, to get him used to where he's going. <laughs> 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 And the lippy as yes, it stank like hell, and the young people walking on Grafton Street, everyone looking so well. Kelty and Boldy is my name. From my home I was forced to roam, but the love of my country. I will never deny, and they call me the bold county boy. Long came a white steed, the finest array, and it carried a young man, these words he did say. Come and live by the great moon that rules the strong tide. Climb up on me horse, love, and be my sweet bride. 